Hello and welcome everyone. In this podcast, we're going to talk about bacterial conjugation. Remember, this is one of the three types of, back of horizontal gene transfer. Conjugation, transduction, and then transformation. And these are experiments done by two scientists, Lederberg and Tatum. I'll write their names down here. I'll probably erase them in a moment because we're going to need this space back. But what they did was they took some bacteria that were met minus, biotin minus, threonine plus, leucine plus, and thiamine. Plus. They grew these in a liquid culture, so they would grow in density and you'd have a lot of samples. Remember, a very important part of genetics is working with an organism that divides really fast, and bacteria does this better than anything. They then took this culture here and they plated it on minimal media. Remember, minimal media only contains the nutrients essential for bacterial life. Water, sugar, and salts. It doesn't contain any of these amino acids. So since this bacterium lacks methionine, the ability to make methionine or biotin, we get no growth. It's an oxytrope for methionine and biotin. They then did a separate experiment, which was the reverse. Met plus, biotin plus, threonine minus, leucine minus, and thymine minus. They then grew that in minimal media to get a lot of cells and played that on minimal media. The same kind of minimal media, only containing sugar, water, and salt. And again, no growth. Because this bacteria is an oxytrope for threonine, leucine, and thiamine. So this was nothing new. We all, they knew this, they had known this for a long time. However, what they did next was, in the same culture tube, so they put a bacterium that was met minus, biotin minus, threonine plus, leucine plus and thymine plus. This strain here. They put that in the tube, in the culture tube. But they also put in it methionine plus, a strain, a bacteria strain that is methionine plus, biotin plus, threonine minus, leucine minus, thymine minus. So the opposite of this one here. They then grew that so they have a nice high density of cells and plated that on minimal media. And what they found were colonies. Not a ton of colonies, but certainly several colonies that grew. So what explains this result? Why can they now grow? So I'm going to erase what I have on the left part of this and I'm going to keep this over here since that's the one that grew. So based on the other experiments we've done show, talking about DNA is the genetic material, we might assume that there's a virus that's in there. That's transferring, let's, let's number these here. Strain one, and this one here is strain two. So it's possible between strains one and two, a virus, just put a V here, takes DNA from one and takes it over here. That's a possibility. They didn't know about this yet, but as we look back on it, that could have happened. Alternatively, maybe one of the cells died and then took the material over there. We know this is called transformation, so that's what I'll put here. They didn't know this at the time. This, of course, again, they didn't know this term, but transduction. In this example here, you might have had this cell here, say strain one, could have lysed and sent its DNA over to strain two. One might have also thought that strain one or two mutated. 
that this methionine mutated so it was met plus, and this biotin mutated because it was biotin, it became biotin plus, and over here threonine, leucine, and thymine also mutated. This we know we can pretty much rule out, because it would be unlikely to have two of these kinds of reversions. Alternatively, the last option was that there is physical contact between one and two. So what we really want to focus on is either this first one, the second one, or this last one. We can pretty much be sure that it's not a mutation. And we can talk a little bit about that in class too, why we're certain it's not a mutation. So I'm going to erase this and go on to the experiment that showed that, here's a spoiler alert, that it is actually this one. So this next experiment it was done by Bernard Davis in 1950, so a few years ago, and he used something called a YouTube apparatus. Cleverly named because it's a tube shaped like a U. We know if we allow the two strains to mix, let's go ahead and write them over here again. We'll write them on either side. So strain one, we're going to put over here, it's met minus, biotin minus, threonine plus, leucine plus, and then thymine plus. Over here, our strain two was met plus, biotin plus, threonine minus, leucine minus, and thymine minus. So we know if we mix these together in the same tube, that we're going to get some cells that are completely prototrophic, that is, able to make all five of these nutrients. We know if we grow these individually in separate cultures that we'll get no prototrophs. They will both still remain oxytrophic. So the question is, do the cells have to physically come in contact with each other in order to produce a prototroph? Or are they just transferring genetic material? So what they did here was they put a barrier here. This barrier will allow small things to go through. DNA could fit through here. A virus could fit through here. But a bacteria could not. So we would say this barrier is selectively permeable. It's permeable. Some things can go through there. But it's selective because it won't allow everything through there. Large cells cannot make it through small molecules like DNA can. So they put minimal media in this U2. Water could go through here too, or the new media could go through here. They then place strain one here and strain two here. They then let the experiment go for a specific amount of time. Then they removed media from side one, and they removed media from side two, plated each of them on minimal media, incubated them, and what they saw was no growth for tube one, or strain one, and for strain two, also no growth. Suggesting that the way to get the fully prototrophic organism being met plus, biotin plus, threonine plus, leucine plus, and thymine plus, was that these two strains not only had to be in the same proximity to each other, but they had to physically connect with each other because this barrier prevented them from doing that. If you remove this barrier, then you would get growth. You would form these prototropes. And this is called conjugation. Should have had a drum roll before that, but conjugation. Okay, so let's erase this and talk a little bit more about conjugation. There are some really amazing pictures showing this where you have the one bacterium here and another bacterium here and this one here sending out this extension to connect with the other bacterium to allow for the transfer of DNA between the two. This extension from one bacterium to the other is called the sex pillus. Several scientists were looking at this after Bernard Davis's experiments a lot of people started really looking at this, and several independently came up with this idea that not all bacterium are created equal in this regards. 
they discovered that about 5% of bacteria can act as a donor. Meaning only about 5% of them have the ability to make this sex pillus and then this bacterium that makes this sex pillus can now donate some of its genetic material. It doesn't go in the reverse. This bacterium isn't going to be able to transfer back. Only a small percentage of them can actually do this, act as a donor. Let's write the word donor on this side. Because it is the donor that generates the sex pillus. Though they didn't know it at the time, we now know it. But these donor cells that generate the sex pillus have a piece of DNA, a small circular piece of DNA in them that's not part of the chromosome, it's extra to the chromosome, that provides this ability. And they call that the F factor. So both of these strains have the nucleoid, the chromosomal DNA, but those that have the F factor in them that can act as a donor to generate the sex pillus to donate DNA have a much smaller piece of DNA known as the F factor. We call these strains that have the F factor F plus those strains without the F factor are called F minus. The genes on this F factor are all necessary to make this sex pillus. And we know what these genes are. And your book probably lists them. In fact, it does list them. But you don't need to know all these genes. You just need to know that the F factor contains the genes necessary to make the sex pillus to allow for conjugation. One other point I want to make here is that after conjugation, or you can say the result of conjugation, makes the F minus cell, the recipient cell, it now becomes an F plus cell. And that is because the DNA that is transferred from the donor to the F minus cell is the F factor. Now this cell doesn't lose it, it copies it, and that when it, as it's copying it, it sends it over to this cell. So one F plus and one F minus cell results in two F plus cells. Now not all bacteria do this in the exact same way, but this is a general trend that, that we see in most of the bacteria, with, with a few exceptions, of course. I want to say just a little bit more about this transfer, and that is, remember, this DNA, I'm going to draw it maybe just a little bit bigger here, just so you can see it. Remember, like all DNA, it is a double helix. So I'm blowing this up to be much larger. As the DNA is transferred, what, what happens is it sort of unravels the two strands. And it does that using an enzyme with a very clever name called DNA relaxase. Relaxase allows for the transport of one of these strands. So it's not like it copies the DNA and puts the whole copy over there. It sends over one strand. So what this cell receives is one strand. And then, in the process, this cell over here loses a strand. And so the first thing, once it gets over here, is it replicates. So it is now double-stranded. And then this one here replicates as well, so it remains double-stranded. We call this a rolling circle replication, where it kind of rolls off of this circle here, into here, over this cell, and then copies. Now, I want to define one more term on this slide here, and that is the term plasmid. It turns out this F factor is a plasmid. Plasmids are extra chromosomal pieces of DNA. They replicate by themselves, and in, in, for the most part, they are independent of the actual chromosome. They contain fewer genes, but they're incredibly important. Like we see with the F factor, some plasmids provide fertility. in the form of conjugation. Another very important role of plasmids, not all plasmids, for instance, the F factor only is involved in fertility, but some plasmids are known as resistant plasmids. They contain various kinds of antibiotics to help the, the particular bacteria survive in the presence of various toxins. So these are very important for the bacterium. And then we have these called degradive plasmids. And like their name suggests, these plasmids contain genes that allow the bacteria 
to degrade unusual products. Your book provides an example of the complex product, uh, chemical called toluene. Bacteria cannot usually digest this, but those bacteria with this kind of plasmid in them can. I want to define what an HFR strain is. And in doing so, I want to explain how it is made. You start off with an F plus cell, E. coli cell. And this E. coli cell has its chromosome in it. And being F plus, it also has the F factor in it. And what happens is this F factor becomes integrated into the chromosome. And when that happens, we call this H. FR. HFR stands for high frequency of recombination. Now what will happen is I need to define another term and this other term is called F prime factor. What happens here is the same cell cuts out this original F factor and it becomes independent again like so. Now interesting though when this is cut out of the HFR strain it takes along with it some of the chromosomal DNA and so now this factor here the F factor that's been released contains all of the genes that make it F plus but also some of the chromosomal DNA and so this we call F prime. Now when we take this F prime cell I want to correct something. The way I drew this is not accurate. When I said the F factor comes out of this HFR strain, I indicated that some of the chromosomal DNA from both sides move with it. That's not true. Only chromosomal DNA from one end of it move over. The other end does not. But it does get cut off here. So this insert that comes into the new F prime factor contains chromosomal DNA from one end. Now this is a very convenient way that we can map genes on the chromosome. Okay, I want to spend a few minutes now talking about how we can use these high frequency of recombination strains and F prime factor to map genes. More specifically to map bacterial genes. And when I say mapping a gene, what I'm really saying is this is a technique we can use to determine the order of the genes as they appear on the bacterial chromosome. So remember, we're going to start off with an HFR strain. Now remember, the, the HFR strain has its chromosomal DNA, the E. coli chromosomal DNA, plus the F plus factor, the F factor, inserted into the chromosome, which makes it an HFR strain. Now remember, in creating that F prime strain, the HFR strain conjugates with an F minus strain. During this process, the HFR genome here gets clipped at the origin of transfer site, which is right between the F factor and the chromosomal DNA. As that happens, it begins to roll off through the sex pillus, taking all of the F factor with it that's inserted into the chromosome and brings it into this F minus cell. Now I didn't mention it before, but let's remember that this F minus cell has its chromosome in it as well. It's just getting this new F factor in, inside of it. And remember when I, I said that when it's transferring, it brings with it a little bit of the HFR's chromosome. And depending upon how long you allow this conjugation and the transfer through the sex pillus to last, will depend upon how much of this chromosome comes through. And the way they do this experimentally is that they put these bacteria in a blender, similar to a blender you might use in your own kitchen. And they just kind of blast it real quick and that disrupts this sex pillus and now the two strains go their separate ways. But let's say, and I'm just going to do, use a relative time period here, let's say 
just a short time of conjugation. During this short time of conjugation, this F factor comes through and then a small piece of the chromosome. Now how are we going to use this to map a gene? Well let's say this chromosome has, well we know that chromosome is going to have many many genes on it and let's say it's a completely prototrophic strain so it's going to be unmutated genes on all of it and let's just make up a few. Let's say methionine, met plus, we go biotin plus and let's go leucine plus. So this strain by itself before it was conjugated with anything it could grow on minimal media. And let's say this strain here, the F minus strain, was oxytrophic for all of those. So it's met minus, biotin minus, and leucine minus. And let's say these and let's say these genes here, met biotin and leucine, we don't know the order of them. And so let's just make a position here for these. So we have a position here, here, and here, but we don't know which one comes first. But we do know that whichever gene is here at this first position will come through with a short period of conjugation. This gene is going to come through with a medium time of conjugation. And then, and then we know this third gene, it will come through after a long time of conjugation. I'm going to remove these nutritional markers from here for now. I'm going to rewrite them up here just to remind us that this original strain was met minus, phytin minus, and leucine minus. And let's say after this short time of conjugation, remember the F factor comes through and enough time has gone through where this first gene will come through. And let's say we allow this to happen, we put it in the blender, breaks the sex pillus, and now you played them on minimal media. Have you played it on minimal media? Let's say this strain, which was met minus, biotin minus, leucine minus, is now still met minus, but now it's biotin plus and leucine minus. So what does this tell us? Well, remember this original chromosome is met minus, or was met minus, biotin minus, and leucine minus, but now it's biotin plus. So that tells us that on this F prime factor, because now it's F prime, that it contains a little bit of this chromosomal DNA from the HFR, HFR strain. And because it's biotin plus, we can assume now that this first position here is biotin plus. And that is what came over on this gene, the biotin plus. That's why it can grow on this media that's lacking biotin. So we know the first position of our chromosome, the first gene on the chromosome, I should say. Now let's say we're going to let it go a little longer. We allow the conjugation between the HFR strain and another F minus strain to occur. And after a, a little bit longer time, we break the conjugation by putting it in a blender and we plate this new strain here. Again, remember that it's going to still have its chromosomal DNA of that original F minus strain. So on this chromosomal DNA here, it's met minus, biotin minus, and leucine minus. We allow the transfer to last a little longer, and because of that, we're going to have the same amount of the F factor here, but we're going to have a larger piece of this chromosomal DNA coming in, like so. And now when we plate that on minimal media, we discover that it is now met plus biotin plus and leucine minus. Still going to have turned over to biotin plus because they're still going to include that first part of that gene, but now it's also methionine plus, which tells us that this second gene here is methionine. And so the two genes on this F prime factor are going to be biotin plus and methionine plus. Now to finish off this experiment, we're going to do the exact same thing again. We're going to cross this HFR strain with an F minus cell that is met minus, biotin minus, and leucine minus. But this time we allow the conjugation to last even longer. And then we put it in the same kind of blender and we disrupt the conjugation and we plate it. And what we discover is that, again, we still again remember it has its original chromosomal here, chromosome here that's met minus, biotin minus, leucine minus, 
But now we've allowed the F prime factor to come in, same size as before, and it allows it to contain all the fertility factors. But now we have even a longer, larger piece of this chromosomal DNA. And now when we plate this on minimal media, we discover it is MET plus, biotin plus, and now it's also leucine plus. So that tells us that the gene next here, after biotin and methionine, is leucine. And so this new F prime strain here contains the biotin plus gene, the methionine plus gene, and now the leucine plus gene, which allows this cell now to functionally be totally prototrophic. Now I simplified this a little bit by only talking about three genes here, but this is how you could map every single gene on the chromosome. And this is how they have mapped all the genes on a bacterial chromosome. Okay, that's all I have for this podcast, so let's close with a quick summary. In this podcast, we talked about how, we talked about the Lederberg and Tatum experiment. You should know that they were the ones that showed that when you mix two cells together, different genotypes, that you can produce a prototrophic strain. So two autotrophic strains made a prototrophic strain. We then talked about the YouTube experiment and how that showed that the way that you produce these prototrophic strains was by physical contact. And then we talked about the physical process of conjugation. We talked about terms such as the sex pillus. We talked about F factor, what that was. We talked about how we make a HFR strain, high frequency of recombination strain. And then we talked about how that strain could make an F prime factor. We then closed with talking about how using HFR and F prime, we could map genes in bacteria. All right. If you have any questions at all over this material, please let me know. I'll be happy to help in any way I can. Until then, I'll see you in class. Bye.